Jersey wins it. Well, you know, Game 6, St. Louis, Detroit in the 1996 playoffs. After the game, I was sitting there saying to Don Cherry, how about Iserman? He scores three goals, he blocks a shot, and the Blues still win the game, forcing the seventh. Isn't that the story of his life? And Don Cherry said, no, he's not a loser. That's not the story of his life at all. Everybody respects Steve Eiserman. Everybody loves Steve Eiserman. I said, well, I only meant, you know, they had those two first-round playoff exits. Uh, they get to the Cup last year. They get swept in uh, four straight. They have a great year. They're in trouble again. Uh, anyway, the truth of the matter is that uh, Don was right. This wasn't the story of his life. This is the story of his life on tonight's Hockey Night in Canada. I don't think there's a precedent for somebody that's... Uh had as big a problem as Steve getting back to professional sport. That would be a bonus, really. I really would like, you know, one more opportunity to experience what I experienced last year. Six months ago, this was a happening place. The Detroit Red Wings had just captured their third Stanley Cup in six years. But as the 2002-2003 season got underway, the Red Wings were without their heart and soul, Captain Steve Eiserman. Eiserman was recovering from surgery to repair a badly damaged knee. It was an injury many predicted would end his career. Those who know Stevie Y know he's made a career out of meeting and beating adversity. This is a Hall of Famer who has done it all without recognition, without drawing attention to himself. It's why Steve Eiserman's known as the quiet superstar. This is where it all began, with a young boy playing the game he loves, on his home rink in front of family and friends. A modest, shy, polite kid probably would never allow himself to dream that one day this rink would bear his name. Steve's a very quiet person and, and sort of a very uh, introverted person. Ron and Gene Iserman are enjoying their retirement in Nepean, a suburb of Ottawa. They've been here since 1975 when Ron moved the family from British Columbia to take a job with the federal government. The Isermans raised five kids, four boys and a girl, Stephen was the third oldest, a quiet kid with a flair for hockey. Very early on, I, I, I felt that he had the ability to become a professional hockey player. But I certainly never had the sense that he was going to be a star. It was Steve's older brother, Michael, who got him hooked on the game. The reason I played hockey because I went and watched him play. And uh, he was a good hockey player. We were probably pretty much equal at, uh, at younger ages. I just, um, I don't think it was ever his goal to be a professional hockey player. He just uh, had other interests. And uh, for me, that's all I wanted to do. He would go out of his way to play hockey in the basement, ripping up my basement with the shots. Well, he'd even have his grandmother when she would uh, babysit playing goal. They'd be using the tennis ball, be flipping the shots at her type of thing. In hockey, as in life, Steve's biggest influence was his dad. He came to a ton of games um, and practices, whether it was at 5.30 in the morning. And uh, every now and then, my dad would, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how you would say it, but if I wasn't working hard or whatnot, he would let me know. And I used to always say to him, you know, as good as you are or think you are, there's always somebody that's going to be better than you. And, and, uh, so, and, and that'll be a come down. If, if, if you allow it to sort of be your motivation. And so it's, it's better to just go about your business. Uh, and if you're good, people will know you're good. You don't have to sort of advertise it type of thing. He had pro written all over him at 14 years old. At the tender age of 14, Steve joined the Nepean Raiders. He was too young, too small, but he was talented. He played the game of hockey better than any kid I've ever seen. And he was 14 years old. He played the game better than any kid I'd ever seen at 16 and 17 years old as a 14 year old. Iserman was so good, he skipped a level of minor hockey to play with Nepean's junior team. He was playing with 16 and 17, 8, 20 year olds. They were all, they outweighed him by 30, 40 pounds. He got hit, but he never got, they couldn't tag him. Like they couldn't really get a good piece of him. He would take his checks, but, but he had the skills to, to and some players have this, the, 
they never really get hit dead on. You know, they they sort of have that innate ability to to be able to slip off uh, hard body checks and to learn how to take care of themselves. As good as he was at avoiding hits, Iserman was even better at avoiding praise. It was a trait that would stick with him his entire career. Well, he's a very private kid. Never, you know, never, never wasn't a braggart. Had no ego at all. Absolutely no ego. And. Uh, so if you went and said, man, Steve, you're a really great hockey player, it embarrassed him. He just did his thing. Put on the skates, taped a stick, and wanted the puck badly in, in game-crucial situations. Darren Pang played goal with Iserman in the Pian and remains one of Steve's best friends. He feels Iserman's quiet strength came from his parents. His father, Ron, was quiet, stern when he had to be, and I think... Uh, his mother, Jean's a heck of a woman that uh, never complained about anything and always made sure everything was done. So I think if you take the, the two strong traits of both his parents, uh, I think you've got a heck of a person right there, and I think you see a lot of Steve in them. All the indications pointed out towards great attitude, uh, well brought up, well behaved, uh, respectful. Long before Jacques Martin became coach of the Ottawa Senators, he was a part-time scout for the Peterborough Peets of the Ontario Hockey League. I felt that, uh, that Steve was a tremendous player, like at 15, to be the second leading scorer in a Tier 2 Junior League. Uh, I mean, to me, it showed like how his biggest asset was his ability to, to read the play, you know, read the game. He kept on saying the game revolves around him. When he's playing, it, it, it revolves around him. Okay, well, that gives me the information because we've got to make sure that we get the right data. From Dave Dryden now works at the NHL office in Toronto. Like his brother Ken, Dave was a goaltender. After he retired, he coached the Peterborough Peets. He kept getting phone calls from Jacques Martin praising Iserman. So Dryden decided to visit the young player and his family. The uh, parents were delightful people, uh, very knowledgeable about hockey and very knowledgeable parents. But I remember thinking at the time, you know, Stevie's 5'9", 155 pounds, and I remember looking at the dad and mom and thinking, ooh, they aren't very tall, <laughs> and I, I wonder what's going to happen. Is this kid going to grow up to be any taller than he is? Despite his misgivings, Dryden brought Iserman to Peterborough. The young player surprised his coach with both his skill and his maturity. Well, this, this was at age 15 and 16, and uh, most players at that age, when they get away from home, and they've, there are a lot of distractions, it's a very different life, uh, it, it's hard for them to focus, and uh, in Stevie's case, I never saw that. I just saw this intensity to be a great hockey player. Uh, he was a great young hockey player. He always seemed to be not near the puck, but in a position to get the puck and to dish it off to somebody else. It's like I always felt that Stevie was totally into the game at all times and would feel very disappointed in himself if, if he wasn't playing that way. There's just sort of a an intensity and a fire that shows that he wants to be the best guy he can be. In 1983, Steve Iserman was taken fourth in the NHL draft by the Detroit Red Wings. Iserman in front, right to the goal line, they score! For the 18-year-old, it was a huge step in a hockey odyssey that would take him to the top, but not before a lot of disappointment and pain. Things started well for Stevie Y and the Red Wings here in Detroit. In his rookie season, he compiled 39 goals, 87 points. Both were records. He was named to the 84 Canada Cup team, but unfortunately had tonsillitis through that. That might have been an omen. What seemed like such a promising start was actually a prelude to a few of the toughest years in Iserman's career. Frustration, failure, injuries. And Steve's quiet confidence would be put to the test time after time. Here's Sutter centering a shot. They score! Ben Wilson makes it 7-1. to one. And the Hawks are ripping the Red Wings apart. He was frustrated a lot of times. I mean, he was having great seasons himself. I think he had 39 goals his rookie season. But uh, it was frustrating a lot of nights. Gerard Gallant is now an assistant coach with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Eiserman trying to move in. Eiserman to Gallant. He scores! Gerard Gallant! In the 1980s, Gallant and Iserman were line mates in Detroit. There were a few highs, but far more lows. 
It was real tough. I mean, twice a week we were losing by seven or eight goals, so it was very frustrating. And, you know, the way Steve was, he never showed any emotion. I mean, he, like I said, we were frustrated. We talked about it all the time. Our team wasn't very good, and I was struggling and uh, didn't really have anybody to hang out with. It was kind of a boring time uh, uh, as far as I'd come to the rink and, and practice. And uh, I had a condominium that I had just bought and stayed at that and watched TV. You lose 9-1 or 10 nothing, and you're... You're, the, you're a focal young point of a team. I mean, he's, he's not one to go shaking hands. He's one to put his head down and just leave the building. We just kept pushing forward and saying, you know, it's going to be a good team, it's going to be a good team. But we knew deep down it was, it was going to be a couple of years before we had a pretty decent team. To top it all off, Iserman suffered his first serious injury. So it was, it was a kind of, it was a all in all a pretty lousy year. And the, the Red Wings were commonly referred to as the Dead Wings because they'd had some, some really lean years. Jim joins us from Wisconsin here on the Mitch Album program, 87744 Mitch. Hello, Jim. One of Iserman's close friends during those lean years was Mitch Album, a sports columnist and broadcaster in Detroit. I think because he started so young, he felt that he had a lot of time. Uh, and he was frustrated with not winning, but he also, he was more frustrated with them not building a winning program. It was a joke. It was, a, it was a joke because there, there was no discipline. Someone else who had a front row seat for the Red Wings struggles was Jacques Demers. As head coach in St. Louis, his Blues were in the same division as Detroit. And while he felt many of the Red Wings were just going through the motions, Demers saw one player who was trying hard every night. That player was Steve Iserman. But like, man, he looked small. He looked young. He looked like a boy out there. But I had a lot of respect for him, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, in St. Louis because I knew if we didn't watch him, he'd beat us because uh, he's, he's, at a young age, he was a very good competitor. In 1986, Demers was hired as head coach in Detroit. A few days into his new job, he was approached by Iserman. So that was a case of a young man meeting his new coach, uh, wanting to uh, uh, let his coach know that he wasn't very happy with the season the whole team had, and including himself. So uh, very low-key, uh, not loud. Uh, not outspoken. It was pretty apparent that he was a serious guy. It was apparent that he was the future of the team in terms of, you know, not just playing center, but being almost the center of the team and its focus, its offensive focus and everything like that. You know, there's people who talk to you who are sincere. There's other people who talk to you just to create an impression or just trying to give you any kind of lines that maybe make me feel good about him. That wasn't the case. That wasn't his purpose. So uh, Damaris took a chance and, 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 and gave him the C. So I knew exactly who I was dealing with, but I also knew I had a prized young player that I felt really strong and comfortable that I could make this team a different team by naming him captain. It came as a big surprise. Number 19, Steve Eiserman. Eiserman was just 21 years old. He accepted his new role with his trademark humility. You know, the thing about that team was we had uh, so many changes. There just weren't a lot of guys, uh, you know, that you know, uh, that had been on the team for a while. Um, uh, you know, it was just kind of a real. Uh, uh, you didn't have a whole lot of guys to choose from at the time. The turnaround was dramatic. Eiserman centered it. Score. In Demers' first year, Detroit made it all the way to the conference finals. Here's Eiserman again, out in front of back. In just his second season as captain, Iserman hit 50 goals for the first time. Playing for Jacques, we became a team and we're going to be a good defensive-minded team. And you know, he really started to use me in a lot of situations I'd never been used in before, as killing more penalties, in particular taking a lot of face-offs, which I hadn't really done in the past. But on the same night he scored his 50th goal, Steve Iserman's world changed in another way. You know, I didn't even know what a cruciate ligament was before that night. I'd never heard of him before and uh, um, I remember the play perfectly and still do just uh, was cutting to the net on my backhand and I just lost my uh, uh, lost my edge cutting to the net and you know not going that fast slid into the net thinking you know I'm just gonna you know uh, slide in the net and knock it off or whatever and I hit it and it just didn't move and and obviously it hurt a lot at that time. I was there that night it was like we, we, tr we could uh, throw a pin in the Detroit arena and uh, that's how silence it was. I will never forget that night. And that was kind of the start of a, you know, a, uh, a gradual uh, period where my knee has just kind of, kind of degenerated a little bit over the years, and that was the first significant one. 
That year, Iserman opted not to have surgery and miraculously returned in the third round of the playoffs, where the Wings lost to Edmonton. More playoff frustration followed. In 1990, Jacques Demers was fired. His replacement, Brian Murray, didn't fare much better. The low point coming in 1993. The Wings had had a great regular season, finishing second in their conference and faced Toronto in the first round. The series went seven games, and game seven went to overtime. Park shoving it to the corner. Out front again, Rouse. Scores! Scores! The Leafs win it! First round was, was was really embarrassing for us and you know a huge setback for the organization. I think that was as low as I've ever seen Steve Eisenman because now already you have a guy who's no longer 21 years old. You know, he's in the middle of his career, he's turning the corner on, on his career, and he's starting to think, first round exit, you know, what are we doing here? A bitter, a bitter loss for the Red Wings. Because I really felt like and look back and stood there. that was really a good team and uh, we really didn't know how to handle that situation. The Toronto just kind of sat back and played a solid defensive game and you know, we're forcing and forcing and uh, uh, you know they eventually just beat us and we couldn't score enough we couldn't score enough goals to you know to make up for the fact that we weren't comfortable playing a tight defensive game. He was in tears after that one and he really got frustrated and uh, early exits from the playoffs once the Wings had good regular season teams, I think bothered Steve Eiserman even more than when they had bad teams from beginning to end. How devastating that was. It seemed like every year they, they took a, two steps forward. It was that one crushing blow backwards. And, well, he, he, didn't hand, he can't handle that easily, and he didn't. Um, it's like a knife through his heart. I, I think it killed him in, internally. I mean, it, because don't forget, now, we're talking about Stephen... Steven becoming a, a very good hockey player, a star. Okay, but but then, you know, there are always people ready to knock the so-called stars. And then one of the one of the criticisms became uh, that he couldn't win the big game or, or he, he couldn't be a leader. In 1994, another serious injury thanks to a Thomas Steen hit and another first-round playoff disaster. Abject failure for an organization expected to go to the final. The highest scoring team in the National Hockey League. Out of here. Ten years into his career, Steve Eiserman had put up some good numbers. And he'd won the Lester B. Pearson Award in 1989. The most valuable player in the NHL is voted by the players themselves. But there were whispers. There was a feeling he'd not received the respect he deserved, mainly because he had not won the Stanley Cup. And a winner, in my opinion, is a guy who goes out and gives it all he has and plays well and shows up and is a good teammate. And there's a definite difference between a guy who's a winner and a champion. And you don't control being a champion, but you control being a winner. His contemporaries were, you know, a Wayne Gretzky, uh, Mario Lemieux. You know, he, he played uh, while those guys were the superstars of the game. And when he was putting up the amazing numbers, they still, compared to those guys, were third. They all won Stanley Cups before him. And somewhat because he doesn't like to sell himself, but somewhat because they achieved their goals before Stevie Y did, it may have hurt him a little bit. You know, now America, anyhow, doesn't have mentality for the third guy. You know, the first guy, maybe a little of the second guy, but the third guy already. We're playing a team sport, and you don't control, you don't build the team, you don't draft the players, you don't make the trades, you don't make the decisions, you just go out and play. Well, I think uh, often in our game, uh, you don't get the recognition until you win some Stanley Cups. In a way, Eiserman himself was partly responsible for the lack of recognition. He does not seek the spotlight. He jealously guards his private life. As the Red Wings captain, he's known more for what he doesn't say than what he says. It's just his way. I'm a hockey player. I want to play the game. Watch me do whatever you want. Let me play the game, and that's it. And then my car home, dinner with my wife, don't even take a picture of my house. I'm not really looking to be, you know, get my opinion out there a lot or say a whole lot on things. So I, I you know, I don't certainly go out of my way to, to be available. Maybe I should be doing more of that or should have done more of that. Some people don't want to be in front of a camera. Some people would prefer to be back in the, the back row as opposed to up front uh, where all the action is. And I think that's just the type of uh, person he was. I think that he doesn't respect people who ham it up as far as uh, they, you know, they do one thing in the dressing room, but but then they act a different way when the cameras are rolling. When I see a lot of guys uh, 
uh, uh, when a camera comes on, they're not themselves anymore, and that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, I see guys light up and uh, thrive on this attention, and they're not really being themselves. You know, and I just don't believe that. I just go out and play. But the lack of a championship led to doubt that Eiserman was the man for the job. His name surfaced in trade rumors. His days in Detroit seemed numbered. With a long tradition and a loyal following, Detroit loves to consider itself Hockey Town USA, and with four cups in the 1950s, it sure felt like it. But from 1955 forward, this organization knew a lot of futility. For Steve Eiserman, the story was becoming the same. Ten years into his career, the captain had known some personal success, but as a team, there was plenty of heartbreak. Well, in 1994, things would begin to change thanks to two significant arrivals. One was Scotty Bowman. The other was Steve and Lisa's first child, Isabella. You know, again, hockey had so much importance, and I had so, you know, that's all I'm, you know, focus on and concentrate on. And, um, and then once we, our first child was born, and then having two and three, it's like, it changed things a lot. When you come home after a game, you know, uh, Lisa didn't really want to hear about the game anymore. My attitude changed for sure. You know, I got to a point where, you know, whatever happens, if I don't win the Stanley Cup, it's, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world. I've got more important things here. And things will, and everything will work out just fine. Steve Eiserman, a wrist shot, scores! He was having the time of his life, loving the game, still hadn't won a cup, but you could just see a, a transformation into uh, not having so much pressure on him and just saying, you know what, I'm going to do what I have to do, play as hard as I can. If, if I win, I win. If not, I'm just going to enjoy the game. It's more fun now. The other big change was behind the bench. Scotty Bowman had taken over as coach, a six-time Stanley Cup winner with a reputation for unorthodox tactics. Scotty Bowman's way is to come into a town and get into the heads of everybody, including the stars. And uh, he monkeyed around with Steve Eisman's head pretty good for a stretch there. I'd been in uh, Pittsburgh with Barry Lemieux. Uh, I'd been with uh, Montreal, and they had many great players. So I think he, 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 he knew that I had been connected with other great players, and I might probably compare him to some of them. You kind of got to figure out what he wants uh, wants you to do and what you really have to do is you prove yourself that you can be a reliable player, particularly reliable defensively and and that you're going to compete in, in road games and tough buildings and whatnot. That's kind of responsibility of the coach. You know like uh, uh, the player has to perform as well. I mean it, it comes down to that but I, uh, I've always been one to try to push players to their to their abilities. I don't think Steve felt he had a bead on him. And, and there were times where, you know, it was sort of like, who is this guy? What, what, is, what is he thinking? What is he doing? Apparently, Bowman was doing something right because he led the Wings to the Stanley Cup final in 1995. New Jersey swept the series, but Hockey Town had finally returned to the big show. The winner onto the conference final. Better off for checking hard. Iserman gets up. Can't get the shot now. Centers! Big rebound! Case. The following spring, the Wings were once again in the hunt for the Stanley Cup. Their second round series against St. Louis went to a seventh game and into double overtime, setting the stage for an indelible Iserman moment. And he saw it, dropped it back. Gretzky picked it up, couldn't find it. Iserman is turning and coming in. Another shot, score! It was pure Iserman magic, but the joy was short-lived. Detroit would be eliminated in the next round, another year without a cup. Iserman was again making headlines, but for all the wrong reasons. I just resigned to the fact that, you know, hey, uh, I'll play and whatever happens, happens. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not gonna worry too much about it. The only, the only difficult part, and all guys go through that, is it's just unsettling, because you're answering all these questions which you don't know anything about. Everybody's coming to you, have you heard anything? And you're the last one to know. So it, it just gets, uh, it gets very irritating after a while. Yeah, I think it would be difficult on any player once his name gets out there, and uh, especially a top player like he was, and uh, you know, in the prime of his career. For a guy who really had earned the right to a certain amount of uh, respect, there were a couple years where he was treated uh, uh, 
poorly for, for a team captain. Steve was being treated like a, a third line player at that particular point just to, I guess, test his resolve. It never got very serious to trade a player like that. I mean, there was a lot of, you listen to a lot of people, you know, but uh, there's, always, there's always conversation. Then somehow what happened was Bowman be ended up here long enough that he let go of picking on Steve Eiserman. And he started picking on everybody else. And uh, they would come to Eiserman and they'd say, uh, oh, he's picking on me, he's picking on me. And Eiserman became this guy who said, it happened to me, it's gonna happen to you, it'll pass. His resolve was probably stronger than Scotty Bowman ever imagined. Scotty's strength was, is, in my opinion, is, uh, from a player's, is you knew that you were just, just on the edge of getting in the doghouse. And you didn't want to have that one game or that one shift where he felt he saw something that he didn't like and, uh, and lost faith in you. So that kept you kind of you know, pretty motivated and working hard. I think once it's over and then you reflect on it, they know that it was in the best interest of trying to get them to the top level of their game. Come the 1997 playoffs, Detroit had a new determination not to let things slip away again. Even when the Wings lost the first game of the conference final against Colorado, Iserman felt something special was happening. We became a really hard team, that team in 97. Difficult to play against, even though we lost, we were like, God, you know, we played well. Just sitting there in the locker room, the guys after game one thinking like, hey, we can, we can, we really feel we can beat this team. As we just stick with what we're doing, we'll be okay. The Wings stuck to their game, and it paid off. Broken up by Larry Adott. he finds LaPointe, there's the shot, he scores! They beat Colorado, setting up a date with Philadelphia for the Stanley Cup. It's going to be an uplifting final. The Wings and the Flyers in a Stanley Cup showdown. I think we were, you know, by a lot of people, considered to be the underdog because Philly was a big team, uh, big, bigger in size than us, but we felt that we were a little harder team. was no contest. The Wings took the first three games and were one game away from their first championship in 42 years. And Steve Iserman was on the brink of erasing 14 seasons of injury, frustration, and doubt. Our locker room was so silent before the game and we were nervous more so than any point. You know, here we are up 3-0 in the series and, and we were, it was really a struggle to kind of, you know, calm down here and, and play that game. With a minute to go in game four, Detroit was up 2-0. Then, Red Wings a goal in a second. And that's enough. Long shot from the line. They score! Philadelphia Flyers get a goal. But only 14.8 seconds remaining. We kind of just shook our head on the bench. We had kind of had a history of making games a little bit more exciting at the end than we needed to be. And I uh, just felt that, you know, they're not going to score now. We're going to win this game. We're not, you know, we're not going to. You know, blow this thing now at this point. So here we are, Eiserman on the ice where he should be at center ice where he should be. There she goes. Counting it down was was really exciting.